All right, today I'm here with my brother, mi hermano, Jonathan Rios. You may uh, hear me slip out of character and refer to him as Juanatan affectionately. There are usually some people who are domain specific, but Jonathan is really one of those people I appreciate who is a genuine, uh, you know, a, a recall to the Renaissance men or to the, the polymaths, which themselves are terms that are abused nowadays. But him and I, I think, both appreciate being generalists. And we're also, as another commonality, children of uh, immigrants from the greater Southern California region, although he may take gripes with that and, and want to claim the Southern portion of Central California for a bit, and we can get into that. Um, but he he's a man who particularly of, of the many topics we may get into today, specialized in the English language. And you'll definitely know that from his diction as we get into this conversation and invited me while he was president of the the sponsored university debate team at Pepperdine University to join forces. He's convinced me to do that amongst many other things in uh, in our life and, and our many connections together. So uh, bienvenidos patron. Thank you, sir. Thank you for having me and thank you for the high praise. I'm always uh, a little uncomfortable regarding <laughs> in such a highlight, but I appreciate it. And uh, yeah, I'm, I'm excited to get into it, discuss some topics. Yeah, all, all, all facts, no capping. And, and you know you know that uh, about me. I'm not just going to ramble and, and say things that are not true. One of the reasons I, I thought of you most recently is there was a video going around and I, I'm, I'm trying to use the most general, polite terms possible because I don't want to get anything twisted about the video. But in general, what I could say about the video is it's a video going around. I saw it shared by uh, Peter Schiff's YouTube channel. I've actually mm -hmm. met the gentleman in, in, in real life where he came as an expert on the Federal Reserve to the Honorable Congressman Dennis J. Kucinich's office, of which I was the legislative intern at the time, back in 2011. And, and there are some things I, I definitely appreciate about his analyses, like of the initial market crash and, and things like that. But so the, the video itself, in as general terms as possible, shows what I would call kind of the epitome of performative debate within the parliamentary debate um, circuits and and people who ended up becoming champions of that and and I personally find the the style itself disagreeable but you know to a greater degree the comments of that video as oh, yeah. you pointed out to me off camera are maybe even more disagreeable maybe unquestionably more disagreeable just basic like misogyny racism and, and I think a base level of ignorance of what exactly is going on. Like maybe they could see the the general rhythm of what's going on, but they don't understand. So can yeah, let's and, let's and, zoom out and tell us about like debate in general, and then let's talk about that. Like, can you tell us what is at the collegiate level, parliamentary policy, um, maybe even Lincoln Douglas and speech, if if you have time, and and how you entered that world? Yeah. So um, I started my I guess, competitive debate career, uh, my sophomore year of high school. Um, and it was really by accident. I had an extra period. I didn't need to take Spanish because, you know, I'm a native speaker and I was already pretty far ahead of the ball. Um, so I hadn't, you know, I just out of nowhere, an extra period freed up. And in some you know, passing by, I heard the word forensics, mm -hmm. or, which is what it, it's referred to commonly debate. It's called forensics. I guess the forensics of argument. Um, I heard it brought up and I was just like, let's try it. Had no, yeah, idea, that's a great word. Had no idea, um, you know, what I was getting into or how much I would love it. Um, and how, how devoted I would become to it and, you know, eventually get a college scholarship because of it um, and, you know, compete at a pretty high level. Um, top tier, yeah. top tier. I'll, I'll, I'll let you humble brag it, but I'm going to call it out top tier. And you were president of that right. team. Yeah. So I eventually become president of Pepperdine's college team. Um, but yeah, in high school, I really stumbled onto it as just another class to fill up time. 
And I got very lucky in that the guy who had taken over the class that year was actually really passionate about the activity. Uh, Mr. Keller, I forget his first name, but Keller, uh, a Mormon man uh, who had been competitive at the high school level. I think he had been to the um, been to the finals of his state championship way back in the day. Um, and he really, like, he, he had a huge passion for it, um, and that helped a lot in getting me into it. Um, and for my very first competition, you know, even though it didn't go well at all uh, for me, I mean, I, did, I, did a, I didn't place or anything, but I knew immediately, like, this is, this is exciting. This is interesting to me. It's a way for us to compete intellectually. And at that point, you know, I had lost a lot of faith in our academic system. You know, I was getting bored, <laughs> you could say, um, because I knew that, you know, just looking at the landscape, to me, grades weren't reflective of intellect. You know, there were a lot of holes I saw with our academic system, but this seemed like a pure way to compete at an intellectual level that, you know, I just hadn't come across before. So uh, like a clash of ideas of which we probably idealized university to be, whereas right. we did not find it to be that way. And, and yeah. people could misinterpret your lack of enthusiasm at the time for, you know, like lesser intellect or lack of knowledge right. when they're subsumed in that. I, I felt some of that actually in regards to STEM as a field in high school. Oh, and yeah. I regret it now because one teacher kind of gave me that bad feeling and I avoided STEM as much as possible. I still took a statistics course and a very generic science course that had no lab in college. But I, I, I saw you recognize that. And, and again, I just have to brag about my homie here. I, I saw even I think some of our peers not recognize the sort of raw intelligence that you had because it wasn't fitting into the pegs that they were accustomed to. But even at the time, even if I couldn't make it explicit, I implicitly knew and recognized the same thing in academia that, that, that you saw. Yeah. So, and you know, again, that's not to say that like, you know, I don't believe in education or that school is inherently bad. Um, I just saw a lot of flaws in our academic system. I saw a lot of people, you know, I could look around at my classmates, you know, and our valedictorian of my high school was for sure probably the smartest kid at our school. But beyond that, you know, when you saw the kids in the honors classes or the advanced classes, they weren't necessarily, in, in my view, just speaking, they weren't necessarily smarter. They had adapted better to the academic system, but to me that didn't necessarily translate to, you know, you're a better human being or you're have a higher intelligence quotient, you've just figured out how to game the system. Um, and literally, you know, knew of kids stealing exams so that they could get better grades. Um, and the, the last thing I'll say about that and about my high school experience was that I, along with the valedictorian, passed eight AP, which are college exams basically that give you college credit. I came into college with a full year of college courses already passed. Um, but I uh, didn't do as well as a lot of other people grades wise in pretty much all of those classes. Um, in fact, I failed a couple of those classes, but passed the college exam um, because, you know, I was caught up in other things. You know, I wasn't necessarily applying myself in terms of the homework and other assignments and work that I just didn't really have an interest in because there were a lot of other things I was interested in applying my time towards. So, um, but to circle back to debate, high school debate, college debate, how it's evolved, what it is, um, one thing that's interesting about debate is that it's a very insulated activity, right? It's not actually very public um, and they haven't done a great job, you know, whether it's because they didn't want to or because the public really hasn't taken to it, it's not a spectator sport. People mm -hmm. aren't, if you're not a part of the community of debate, you're not going out of your way to find college debate or to find high school debate 
and see how exciting it is. And if you did come across it, you probably wouldn't get what you thought is, you know, rigorous intellectual competition. That doesn't mean it isn't, um, but because it's so insulated, um, it's taken on, you know, even beyond the performative aspect of it, even when you look at, you know, policy and parliamentary debate, which are the two most dominant um, and competitive forms of debate, um, fairly similar at this point. With policy, you have one topic year round that you research and that you provide a lot of supporting evidence for um, that literally colleges have, you know, teams that they hire to do research for their students to provide them with materials which give you know, universities like Harvard and Yale, giant advantages over smaller schools, um, which makes it pretty hard to break into those activities. Parliamentary debate um, is almost the opposite. You get a new topic every single round, and to a degree, it kind of levels the playing field in that way for smaller universities, which is where we were able to compete at Pepperdine at a more national level, where we couldn't really at the policy debate level. Um, but in both activities, um, you know, because I was looking back at a at a, a video of the 1994 uh, national college debate finals for policy debate, and they're talking at, you know, I'd say an average of 300 words per minute. Now, when you think about that, you're like, mm -hmm. how can that how can that be persuasive? You know, how does that make sense? Like the average person, or even a really smart person who isn't engaged in competitive debate would look at that and be like, this is complete nonsense and garbage. But competitors have adapted to the activity and the form that it took on just like any other sport. Um, you know, if, The rule set, yeah. Right, the, the rules and what was winning debates. Because ultimately what you're pandering to is the judges, right? So if you want to blame yes. competitors for doing something wrong or bad, what they're trying to do is secure a win and what they see working in terms of what judges are voting for, they're going to lean into that. Um, yeah. and, that's, and, and you so, and I were ourselves judges at the lower right. levels. I remember judging high school level, and I know you were more far experienced than me, so you probably did it more. And I would be explicit when I was a judge of high school debates. I would tell them what my judging philosophy was, and I didn't make that up. I remember there were some people we would look at some debate forums back in the day and, and we were there, you know, uh, between 2007 and 2012. I remember some people had on their websites what their judging philosophy were. And and there were a minority that were closer to, I think, what you and I would appreciate. But the majority swung the way of, of how you're describing it. Right. And so, you know, the reason that debate has gotten sped up. Right. So let's start with the first part of it. Right. So if we look at the history of competitive high school and college debate. Right. You know, uh, I forget what movie came back, came out a while ago about like one of the first great upsets where um, it was a smaller local college beating. Was it Harvard? Uh, yeah, I think it was like a black debate team or something. Yeah, yeah, they beat Harvard and it was like this crazy upset. Um, and that's probably what people think of when they think about competitive debate, right? It was, they were making slow, methodical arguments. Um, it was almost yeah. like what, you know, it's, it's what lawyers do more or less, right? Lawyers yeah. aren't It's called The Great people. Debaters. It was in 2007 with Denzel Washington. Right. So, um, and it looks like what happens in a courtroom, right? Um, which is what, you would think, hey, this is what's happening on the, prof you know, this is basically professional debate. Lawyers are professional debaters. Yep. Isn't that what's going to be happening at the college and high school levels? Yep. Well, the reason it's not um, is, again, because of what started working and what started winning, right? Um, just like in the NFL, where people thought it was crazy when they started throwing the ball, right? It, initially, football looked more or less like rugby, right? Mm -hmm. People tossed the ball back and forth, and it was mainly a run first game. And then as teams started throwing the ball and having success in that area, that started becoming the dominant, you know, method of playing football. So, and you know, equipment of, changes with the equipment changes, right? So pads and helmets, right? And and same thing <laughs> with basketball. You know the you know now everyone's shooting threes. Before it was all back to the basket. 
So it, M- it, MMA used to have no gloves and no rounds or at least unlimited rounds. Now they have like five minute rounds and right. limited amount of rounds right. and gloves. So every competitive activity goes through changes based on what works. The difference with debate, like I said, is that it's an insulated activity. So you don't have to care about, you know, what the public wants other than what your insulated audience is actually you know, responding to in terms of mm-hmm. the um, so The stakeholders are less. Right. So speed became a tool and a weapon within debate because teams realize, okay, we have a limited amount of time to make speeches. If I can make more arguments and the other team can't respond to those arguments, uh, in a debate, you know, those are called concessions. Yep. Right? So you didn't respond to that argument, even if it's somewhat silly or doesn't make 100% sense. If you conceded it, it now becomes a point more or less in my favor. That goes Again, back to your judging analogy. In the court of law, I used to witness a lot of uh, civil law happening when I was a mediator in Los Angeles courts. There would be debt collectors who would come. And if you didn't show up, the judgment would be in favor of the debt collector if you're not right. there. Some of those like right. loan sharks. So, so there's a, there's a real world analogy for what happens in these debates. Again, it doesn't make 100% sense to most people because, you know, you're like, okay, but that doesn't make sense. And why couldn't you respond to it later in the debate? So you have what's called, you know, again, rule format. You have what's called, and this is, again, same in a court of law, right? When you make closing arguments, you're not just going to be bringing up random stuff that you didn't talk about during the trial. It's the same thing in the debate. You've got your um, constructive speeches, and then you've got your rebuttal speeches. And if something didn't get discussed in the construction speeches, you don't get to talk about it in the rebuttal. Um, and, you know, judges will explicitly say that they're going to strike that argument um, or they're not going to consider those arguments. Again, depends on the judge that you're presenting in front of. There's obviously a huge level of variance depending on the judge. Um, but more or less, if you don't talk about something and the other team does, that may be a, something that they use as a critical argument towards the end of the debate. So speed became a part of that tactic. Well, now I'm just going to spit out 100 different arguments, and if you only respond to 10, I'm going to focus on the 90 you didn't respond to and make those the emphasis point of the debate. So, again, as time goes on, right, you've got still these giant universities and colleges with massive budgets and a massive advantage in terms of research, in terms of resources, that basically make it so that smaller universities, typically universities that are giving more access to, you know, minorities, people of color, underprivileged people to get access to the debate activity itself, right? Because you're not going to go to Harvard and get onto the debate team um, if, you know, if you don't have the pedigree, if you haven't already been super competitive. So for new people trying to break into the activity, you have to go to a smaller school. But again, because you don't have the research budget, you're not even going to stand a chance against a Harvard or a Yale because they have all the arguments that you've never heard of before, all the evidence that you haven't been able to research because they have a professional research team that they pay, not students, paid college research assistants that are producing these arguments for their teams. So how does, you know, tiny little Townsend or Louisville's underfunded debate team compete. You have to attack it from a different angle, right? And again, I bring back sports. The Soviets, right, when, when they dominated hockey, they weren't playing the hockey the way the rest of the world was. Their coach had never played hockey. If you go back and you look at <laughs> the, right, how they were able to break through and become this dominant force in hockey, it's, be, it's not because they had a giant pedigree in hockey. It's because they decided to play a completely different game. They invented completely different tactics, right, that that no other hockey team was using. They trained completely differently. They had a coach who had never played hockey and didn't know anything about hockey, right? But they knew how to succeed because they 
invented their own way of playing hockey. And that's more or less where performative debate came from, is, well, we can't out-research, we can't out-evidence these other teams, but we want to be able to compete. And so um, there's actually two, I guess, two different veins. Performance is even a newer level, which um, you see a little bit of that in that video that you're talking about um, from, what was it, the 2008 national final some something like that yeah and i was wondering if you w were were gonna talk about or if at all the critique uh k-r-i-t-i-k was right, kind right. of a precursor to that like right. theory and debate versus policy debate which which our our coach christine at the time sorry i forget her last name um was right. emphasizing policy within policy for us because there's like the greater policy what you're talking about like there's policy debate versus parliamentary debate. We're in the parliamentary side, meaning we get a new topic every time and could be either affirmative or negative on any given issue. But then even within that, this idea of sticking to discussions about policy versus critiquing the theory behind it. And, and in regards to the research you were saying, as, as a quick side note, this is people like Derrida and Foucault and yeah. Slavoj Žižek, some of the postmodern postmodernist and and uh, Marxist philosophers who are now, I think, getting more, uh, more and more, more fame. You know, oh, yeah. we could claim to be the hipsters to being hip to them right. prior to the the masses being hip to them right. because they were brought up in the research in our in our circles. Right. So, so critique kind of evolved first, even before what we call performative debate, um, which is really what uh, that team that w ends up winning the national championship. They were more along the lines of critique. Right. They were they were criticizing, um, you know, the the established way that debate is done, um, which the affirmative in that round was actually doing more the performative side of it. Um, so you again, you get a big clash of styles there. Um, but both sides are deviating from straight up policy based debate around the topic at hand. Um, so the topic in that debate was about, um, you know, basically tweaking the war powers of the federal government, of the executive branch. Um, and, of, you know, a, a, there's different ways to take that topic. But um, the affirmative, again, I didn't watch the entire debate. I tried finding it, but I couldn't. Um, they are doing some type of performance. The negative is critiquing even their performative affirmative. Um, again, without seeing the whole debate, it's hard to know what really happened. Yeah. But, you know, I think the larger point, again, is that they, what they were doing was not necessarily outside of the norm at that point, either team, right? They had become, you know, pretty much common staples of the debate community and ways of arguing and presenting whether people like it or not in terms of the public or whether you and i even like it or not they were winning they were winning arguments they were winning debates and they won a national championship and at the end of the day right what is it that we care about in america Victory, getting the dub <laughs> rings championship uh, right That's if you're not first you're last to quote ricky bobby Right. It's all about rings, right? When we, you know, debate the greatest of all time in any sport, it's all about the rings. And so the comment section, you see a bunch of people who have probably never seen a competitive debate at mm -hmm. all. Um, making, They're the outsiders to that insular community right. that you're talking about, right. rather than you and I who actually were in that and, right. and you who were actually top tier. I, I joined late, I think my junior year of college. And then on top of that, I took a semester in Washington, D.C., like I mentioned earlier, to work in Congress. So mm -hmm. I really messed up my shot of actually being top tier. So I was I was only ever like a JV level debater, I'll, I'll, although, you know, I was hanging around with you cats and even did a summer camp and stuff to do so that I could have at least been bottom rung of the top tier. But you you were up there and definitely like with your partners Justin before and people like Jason and Shiloh who we knew like we knew people who who got to 
you know, the, the championships and, you know, to that, to those high ranking, those top four, final four and, and all that. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, but, but really I think the, the point to be made is that, you know, it's, and it's, and it's a, you know, a lot of the critique of what debate is and has become, I don't think is necessarily unfair. Um, you know, it's not a public friendly, uh, event, right. It's, in the form it is now, it's going to be very hard for that activity to garner public support because people just aren't interested in watching that, right? Um, fast. Uh, yeah, fr- fr- frankly, frankly, I'm not like I I don't like the comments against it, but I'm not a fan of that. You know, nobody's asking me, but I got my own little platform and and space I'm carving right. out on the internet, so I'm gonna say my opinion. There were there were a minority of judges who who presented their philosophies in clear coherent transparent ways that i really appreciated and there were some who didn't talk about their philosophies at all almost pre- pretending that they're nonpartisan or non-biased you know when right. they do have right. biases towards some of these things we're talking about whether it's th- the theory or the critique or or the performance or the policy in my opinion you you talked about earlier on how forensics was this word that drew you it drew me too i mean this is a time when shows that are popular talking about forensic science and right. evidence based things in terms of criminality and and those are some things that we would discuss but this is like regarding the english language itself which i said you know you you majored in and i i've always had a a fascination with not necessarily in an academic setting but in a uh, or let me say an academic setting outside of academia, like those genuine scholars of, of the English language, whether it's H.L. Mencken in his journalism or whether it's John McWhorter in his studying of, of black English and, and all, me, all those people. I, I came a little bit unprepared. I thought my phone was charged. Give me one sec to grab my charger. I'm going to pause you real quick. All right, go for it. This is how you know we're going to give it to y'all raw and real, un- unleashing and uploading the raw versions of this detail. When he gets his charger, we're going to begin talking about forensics, which the full name I was introduced to. I loved forensics as an idea, but speech and debate. And so I remember, as an aside, I uh, was what's called Yabetelij in Amharic speaking culture, uh, someone who stays at home. Some folks online use the word autist a little loosely, especially when it's undiagnosed. But the idea that socialization um, at a high level makes one more agreeable to more people. But borrowing an idea from Malcolm Gladwell, some of the, the greatest thinkers and doers of our time and of any time have been people with high levels of disagreeableness, people who maybe had a smaller set, people who were not social butterflies trying to have a million friends, but maybe who were friendly to every other group and every clique, but didn't associate with any one clique in in high school and in middle school and had their own little crew of best friends, maybe one, two, three at the most. Okay, all right, Romano's back. So anyway, I was making a quick aside of how I was someone who mostly stayed at home in high school and middle school. And one of the things that eventually led to many other leadership roles were uh, first a speech class that I was required to take uh, as an undergraduate. And that led to this this inv- invite from you, the president at the time of, of forensics, the forensics team, which had these ideas, like we said, of allotted beautiful environment for the English language. But the full name, as I recall, was a speech and debate team. And one of the beautiful things about that in relation to the conversation we're having is that speech was one event, debate was another event, and even debate had subcategories. And like I said, nobody's asking for my opinion, but I'm giving my opinion and marking out a space for it. 
my opinion was that every judge should at least, you know, have the responsibility of writing something that says what their philosophy is for the sake of transparency. One, two, these things could have been different events. You could have had a policy only parliamentary debate circuit, and then you could have one that's, uh, you know, includes theories and critiques. Then you could have one that includes performative and you could run the three together and you could even see, you know, especially with transparent judging, which one of these might appeal to the masses and, and and that appeal to the masses, by the way, or at least a minority amongst the masses could create markets that lead to more funding, especially for some of these smaller institutions that you're talking about. But I, I just wanted to put that in context yeah. of like what I thought, like, cause I saw these as, as different games and, and I don't know how you personally yeah, feel I mean, about all I, that. You know, again, there's definitely a large part of the community of the debate community itself that agrees with you that that has that that argument has been had for a while you know ever since these new styles kind of emerged um i would say you know critical or philosophical debate has at this point become pretty synonymous with traditional policy debate um you know performative is its own thing um so speak but, on theory a little bit for example like if someone were to have some sort of policy, like a policy would say the Federal Reserve should enact this for inflation or deflation, someone would come in with a critique of like, let's say capitalism itself. Could, could you talk about like what, what does that look like? Yeah, so, um, you know, let's say, um, you know, basically the argument more or less boils down to capitalism bad. That's a very crude way of saying it. Um, but, you know, regardless of whether or not you think, which again is another argument that the affirmative team has to uphold the topic. Um, most people would say yes. Um, <laughs> and still that did, let, let, let's put that a little more tautologically so everybody could catch your joke, bro. You're saying, does the affirmative have to be affirmative? <laughs> Exactly. Exactly. So, um, <laughs> very controversial, which, right? Which some, you know, some people go against that. Um, but regardless, you know, more or less you're, you're assigned a side per round. You don't get to decide what you're going to represent more or less, right? Which is part of the game and debate is that sometimes you have to represent opposing viewpoints that you may not necessarily be a fan of, right? Being able to argue both sides. Um, so, you know, uh, with critical philosophical debate, right, which is a vein of policy parliamentary debate, you have, you know, the affirmative saying, hey, we're taking this action, we're doing this plan, you know, the federal government is going to pass some policy um, that's going to affect our monetary system in some way. And then they claim, right, the way they go about talking about that um, and the advantages of said plan have inherent economic, you know, benefits, right? Which is not necessarily something they have to do, right? They can focus their case around a number of different benefits or reasons why it's a good idea to do their plan. But there are certain trigger words or trigger arguments where the other team's going to be like, mm, you're supporting capitalism. That's a bad thing. And so uh, the critique could more or less be vote to reject the plan. Let's not do the plan at all, right? right? Let's keep things the way they are because the plan is advancing capitalism a little bit further. And that's not something we want because of all of these reasons. So they may be questioning the fundamental nature of what the affirmative is supporting. Um, and there's, there's a lot of different, it's, it's hard to get into, uh, the nuance of it. Um, but that's, that's one bane of debate in, in my, you know, cause again, I, I've done both sides of it. I, I had a chance to compete against the Harvard and the Yale, um, as well as some of the more performative critical, uh, teams and, 
you know, to me, I don't think we necessarily need, you know, maybe we need a new event also. Um, but at the same time, I'm a fan of the variety, even if I'm not a fan of specific arguments or specific ways. Because, again, that's, again, the whole point of the debate. If you don't like what the other team is doing, then give me a reason to vote against them. Right, so I'm a fan of the chaos because if you can't <laughs> if you can't beat the chaos, then are you really as good as you think you are? Right, so I I, I was into it. I was into coming up against you know you know what you might think of as a wacky off the wall argument because I want to be able to figure it out. I want to be able to use reason to convince somebody that what this other person is talking about is nonsense. And if I can't do that, then maybe it's not nonsense. Maybe it does make sense. Maybe they make more sense than I do. And if that's the case, then I deserve to lose. I, I respect that. It's, it's, it's interesting. How do you, how do you uh, match that with or how does that correlate to our coach who hyper-emphasized this policy style? So you liked using our policy style to combat these other styles but i mean i was you know again i would i would say i'm probably in a lot of respects very traditional right uh -huh. in general as a person um you know <clears throat> even a lot of people would probably consider me a crazy liberal um i'm fairly <laughs> conservative in life in general right i'm a, I'm a pretty vanilla human being um, in a lot of ways, right? You're a married father. Congratulations on that. Thank you. Yeah, you know, I've you know, I've got a wife. I've got a son now. Um, you know, I don't want my wife to work. Um, I'm, you know, I'm a fairly traditional dude. I've got I'm the son of two Mexican immigrants. Um, come from very traditional cultures. So, and same with debate, right? Like when I came into it at the high school level, especially where I came from, Bakersfield, California. Um, it, it was fairly traditional, right? Like people weren't talking crazy fast. Now, if you were able to get beyond Bakersfield to some of the other more prestigious tournaments or to the national level, then you start to see other things. Um, you know. Ultra progressive. I remember a judge I encountered one time on, on a, in a off the record type encounter, not in the act of judging. Mm -hmm. was making jokes about abortion being no different than clipping fingernails. And that was one of the many signs to me of, of just what the general milieu was, where, yeah. where obviously that's not going to be said within the debate itself, but in off-the-cuff conversations in, in, the, in the milieu. And I'm with you. I'm with you. I've, I've come across the term archaeofuturist, recently i used to use the word primitive technologist and i think a, any genuine critical thinker is going to be skeptical of their own time and is going to look and examine the past for whatever good is in the past but also take a look at the the present and the future we're not luddites you know we're not amish no shade at either of those groups but we you know even right now we are talking on a technology that is a result of progress and so we are you know we are on the side of of progress, um, which is, you know, itself, you know, not a term to be taken in a, in a vacuum. And you said some people refer to you as a, as a crazy liberal at the same time, some people refer to uh, libertarianism as right. Some people refer to it as left. And there are those distinctions. And I remember you were open-minded enough in that, in that debate community, for example, to also participate in the, the debates and, and conversations that the, the libertarian club would have at a time up until the point where people want to divorce ideas from grounded reality, where they want to just stay in right. theory. It, <laughs> exact, the exact term that was used was in a vacuum. And in my Positively. mind, I'm, right, I, I'm like, what, what are we talking about again? I thought we were talking about <laughs> government policy and now we're talking about things in a vacuum. I, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you know, a little, little cognitive dissonance there, but um, to, to circle back a little bit, you know, as you said, um, to me, debate is still by far one of the best activities that any kid can get involved with, whether mm -hmm. at the high 
school or college level, you know, no matter how crazy the activity looks, um, there's a lot to be gained from just getting on a stage and having to speak, you know, out loud to people, whatever format you're taking with that, there's a lot of confidence to be gained from it. Yep. Uh, and I would say, you know, it's in my life, it's been one of the core ingredients to my success on any level was the fact that I did high school and college debate. I, you know, I could arguably say that there is nothing else in my academic career that prepared me more for the world and engaging in it than doing competitive debate. Not, not any class, not any professor, you know, and I had some great teachers and professors um, and we went to a great school with, you know, really, really some great thinkers and great resources that we had at our disposal. Um, but which shout out to Pepperdine decided to wear the AOA. Let's go waves. Let's go waves. Um, but yeah, it's for sure, for sure. Like, I don't know if I would have the ability to, to engage in public or to have the confidence to, to speak and engage with people at the level that I do now, if it weren't for debate. In fact, I, you know, I'm, I'm almost a hundred percent sure I wouldn't. Um, not to say that I was antisocial, you know, I did a lot of other activities outside of debate. I mean, I did pretty much every activity possible during high school from marching band to tennis, you know, to running to yeah. Long distance running where uh, you learned the term ambassa. That's right. That's right. From my Ethiopian brother. Um, but yeah, it's, it's it's definitely been uh, a huge blessing for me. Super grateful to the community. Agreed. Um, super grateful to all the people that I was involved with. Um, and still, you know, uh, an activity that I want to continue to support more. Um, you know, great programs out there like the Urban Debate League, which are which are bringing more resources back to again underprivileged schools and areas and people who normally wouldn't get access to, you know, traveling outside of their school and things like that. Um, you know, just being a judge as part of that community, um, you know, when I get the opportunity. Um, but it's, yeah, it's still, it's still a, an activity that I want to see grow and that I want to support. You know, again, like I said, in terms of the public spectatorship, um, you know, I don't, I don't know, um, if the community itself is interested all that much in bringing that up. Um, I think that there is a way to get both, you know, to me, again, I'm always that guy who's trying to pull from both sides. Yeah. I think there's a way to still have performance, still have critical debate that's maybe outside of the realm of what the average person knows or thinks about. Um, and a way to slow it down to a degree and keep it competitive. Um, because again, it's not just, you know, crazy Townsend or the University of Oklahoma or Louisville or these minority teams that are doing things that would turn a lot of people off to debate. It started with the dominant powerhouses like Harvard and Yale mm -hmm. speaking at 300 words a minute. <laughs> right. The gasping. The gasping right. becomes like a metronome. Right. Uh, you know, they're, they're really the, the, the ones that, that have inspired, you could say, these other versions of debate because, mm -hmm. you know, they, they use speed and, again, you know, re large mountains of research that they had access to that no one else yep. did to push everyone else out of the activity to the point where they had, they had to do something, right? Yeah. Like, you know, you can call it guerrilla warfare, but they had to, get, they had to come up with new tactics that allowed them back into the conversation and eventually, you know, got them a championship. And, so, and that's why I invited you here. I appreciate that because I had forgotten about speed in terms of a tactic. Like I, I knew it was there. But in terms of this this tactic that is being used 
to let's say as the original and and who knows it might even been something predating that tactically to game the system to to play with the rule sets within the logical limits that was set at the times for the advantage of people who had certain artificial advantages like you said financial resources and and whatever else it may be and then people with less resources coming back attack i, I want to short uh share a quick anecdote before we go into i think a perfect segue to something else you and i were chopping it up about recently and that short anecdote is uh, i remember when i was judging at one of these urban leagues i believe it was the high school attached to usc in south la at least the northern part of south la there was one student i judged and about a week later went to Tyler, the creator's goblin release party in Hollywood after purchasing the album from Amoeba Music. And it was so funny because he sees me in the line. This dude later goes and does some crazy stuff like licking some throw up <laughs> in front of uh, Tyler, the creator and, and, you know, made some viral, some, some, some made himself a, a little bit of a viral fame from doing something like that. But I remember this is a person who showed these dualities. Like you said, you like to draw from everything, something that may be seen as ignorant or stupid. To me, at the time, I could tell is the conclusion of postmodern philosophical thought that the only thing that really matters is and it goes back to existentialism is what your what your own meaning making was. And he was utterly shook that me, who he thought was some square judge who wasn't dressed the way I was, but with my nice Pepperdine debate jacket at the time and was, you know, giving advice and, and, you know, being all rhetorical and academic, he saw me at the same concert at him. And he was like, judge, like in a high pitched voice, he goes, judge. And he was like, my judge. He dapped me. Yeah. He was, he was <laughs> thoroughly shook that his right. judge, you know what I'm saying? At that time, maybe five to eight years older than him is out there appreciating Tyler, the creator and Damo Genesis and taco and Frank ocean before he was as big. And, um, anyway, that was a quick antidote I wanted to share about what you were saying and about the opportunities and the connection that he was able to see that he was able to relate to a similar black face in a, in a similar place in, in, in this two places, like in an ignorant place, quote unquote, and an intellectual place. And that probably, you know, gave him benefits. It gave me benefits as well. A, a lot of growth, like I said, in leadership opportunities. But we're all talking about open debate. And there's this letter I read from Harper's Magazine. And literally, it's titled A Letter on Justice and Open Debate. It has John McWhorter, who I mentioned earlier, has a bunch of names that I recognize. But from the people who I not only recognize, but but actually like their thought a lot, John McWhorter, uh, and, and it's different thought, uh, Noam Chomsky, J.K. Rowling, some some people who I, I appreciate in at least, you know, the domain in which they talk about. It seems to be a, a pretty generic, vague statement, but a statement they felt they, they had to make about right. people who they view as being a, attacked by, by, by mobs from, from their point of view. What I saw is, and, and there are some radical thinkers in here, but I saw this as kind of a moderate central left debate. Uh, proposition to to limit the tactics of debate and from this conversation you and i just had i think it's the perfect segue talk to us about your interpretation of this and and all the fallout on twitter of this letter and and i think from that lens of tactics and and allowing your ideas and tactics to combat each other because i see yeah, a connection so you know i'll start with a very simple statement that you know, I, guides a lot of my thinking in terms of public discourse, in terms of Twitter, in terms of, you know, people making uh, hateful comments. A lot of things that people would say, well, you know, can you really support that? More discourse is better than less discourse. More discourse is better than less discourse. Right. With you. I'm, I'm not interested in censorship of almost any kind. If someone wants to make a hateful or stupid or abusive uh, 
statement or video or what have you, right? We can say that it's irresponsible to give these people a platform. Um, but the, the better response is to just engage with it, right? And that's exactly what I think people were responding to in terms of this letter, that this letter is about, well, you know, if people want to make statements about things, who are we as the angry mob to challenge them? And really, right, what are they really talking about? Cancel culture, right? The hot new term, uh, <laughs> cancel culture, right? which there's valid criticism about a lot of the reactionary behavior that people are having around simple disagreements, right? Um, there's everything from, you know, Drew Brees, right? Saying, hey, you know, I can't support anyone who disrespects the flag because my grandparents fought in the war to protect our freedom. Well, our freedom includes, whether you like it or not, the ability to disrespect the flag. Two, uh, you're making, I guess you could call it a false equivalence, trying to think of the exact rhetorical term, uh, but kneeling during football games is not about disrespecting the flag. If anything, it's also about protecting the flag and signaling that we're not okay with police brutality and that that doesn't represent the America that we want to live in um, and that that isn't respectful of the flag to just be okay with that stuff. Um, but, you know, uh, whether you agree with the protests, whether you agree with Drew Brees or not, if you disagree with them, if you want to change the channel, change the channel, as George Carlin would say. Um, you know, does it mean that you have to come after Drew Brees um, and make hateful comments towards him because you didn't like what he said? No. But at the same time, the issue with this term cancel culture and the argument surrounding it and this letter is that in, in my eyes, and I could be wrong, more often than not, this term has been birthed out of an attempt for the privilege to insulate themselves from criticism and consequences for their actions, right? Because if we want to talk about real cancel culture, which I think what people are trying to get out is harassment and violence, marginalized people and minority groups have been dealing with that for forever. And it's never been called, we've never come up with a term for it, right? The fact that kids can be expelled from school and adults can be denied access to jobs or can be fired for wearing their natural hair, that's the real cancel culture. Not for stating an unpopular opinion, but literally for just existing and being who they are, for having hair that doesn't look like what majority society thinks it should look like, even though it's their natural hair, even though, you know, again, it's not a statement that they're necessarily trying to make. They're just being alive. Um, you know, if we want to talk about false accusations, which is a lot of what, what's being circulated as well, it's like, oh, well, a lot of this cancel culture, you know, people are being fired over false accusations. They're being threatened over false accusations. Well, what about Emmett Till? What about Ahmaud Arbery, right? Are false accusations even necessary against marginalized groups for the mob to take action against them? What about Tulsa, right? What about the massacre of an entire town just because they were successful and you didn't like that they were successful because they didn't look like you? The Black right? Wall Street. Black Wall Street, right? Thousands of people mercilessly murdered overnight, their town burned to the ground, right? No trace left behind. Why? Philly, Philly firebombing too. The, the commune that wasn't. There's, there's, 
there's tons of examples. There's a, there's actually a good book called white rage uh, that goes through the history of the white mob coming up against the black success and tearing it down for no other reason than it existed. Right. That's not what cancel culture is. And again, if we want to consider cancel culture a real thing, to me, it is a reaction slash symptom to the very system of oppression that the rest of us have had to deal with for hundreds, if not thousands of years, right? Now that that violent and hateful system is touching the privileged, not on anywhere the same level that it's touching the marginalized, but just, you know, some of it is touching the privileged, right? And holding them accountable for certain things that they've never been held accountable. It's cancel culture, right? Yeah, it's a, it's a microscopic, it's a microscopic view of history, myopic, yeah, exactly. when, and it's ahistoricity, really, when we have this grander view of history. And the funny thing about it, relating it back to the debate or the forensics culture that we just talking about is, and, and this is why I called it center left or moderate. It's a certain level, the way I view it, because I'm, I'm someone who likes ta Coates and John McWhorter as an mm -hmm. example. And they, they've had disagreements. They've talked on the same channel before, but they had disagreements. They represent different levels. The one trying to radically critique society, the one saying, we just need to trim a few things. And I think, What's going on is the, the the signatories to this Harper's Magazine letter have some view that there is something okay. There's some level of comfortability they have with the squo, with the status quo. And I think if I, I, I don't want to misrepresent you, you and I look and say, look, the squo or the status quo has some things to be commended, but there are a lot of issues with the squo. And that's yeah. why we entered debate. Is that, is that, I don't know if that's how you so, feel too. Oh yeah. And so I've been getting into more and more Twitter debate, um, which I'm actually enjoying <laughs> you know, trying to be the voice of reason on Twitter. I'm sure a lot of people uh, think that they're the voice of reason on Twitter as well, just because they get to talk. Um, and I'm not saying I'm necessarily right or, you know, the most, uh, you know, righteous, person um you know but i you know i got into it on this thread where a journalist who had criticized the letter right talking about a lot of the same things that we've already talked about um started receiving death threats rape threats uh invitations to commit suicide um all of this harassment and when she posted about it right a lot of people supported her when she posted about it and was basically like hey this is not just about my job right and losing my job this is my life that people are playing with and that's exactly the point right is that the real issue is that marginalized people especially when they speak up about being marginalized get harassed get a targeted with violence and harassment over and over and over until they're either pushed completely to the periphery or they're killed, straight up murdered, right? And that's not what, you know, the person who makes some racist comment and then Twitter goes after them and then they get fired is dealing with, right? Not to say that all of the reactionary behavior is justified, but as Malcolm X once commented on the death of JFK, this is to me a case of the chickens coming home to roost, right? We put and he got a lot of flack for that statement. <laughs> he did catch a lot of flack for that statement. And it's not that, you know, he, did, he wasn't a fan of JFK. And again, I wasn't around back then. And, you know, I don't know exactly what the situation was. Um, I would, arguably say that JFK was a true ally in the struggle. Um, yeah. Whether or not, whether or not, you know, again, even in his statement, even if it was or wasn't about him disliking JFK, 
he wasn't wrong. America has created so much violence, has created, has, has propagated so much harassment and oppression of marginalized people that can you really be surprised that cancel culture, right, that, that it's coming back around and affecting the very people that it's protected and insulated for, you know, several hundred years? No. You've created the very environment that you're living in. So for, for the people out there who are saying, well, you know, we didn't create racism. We didn't, we're not the ones harassing people. You're, one, you're probably benefiting from it in some way, whether you realize it or not. And two, whether or not you personally had a hand in it, unless you're out there actively dismantling that system, it's going to, it's, it's going to affect all of us in some way, and it does affect all of us in some way, and it's naive for us to think that these things aren't related. So I got into it um, in the comment section of this, this woman's post where she was talking about being targeted, and a lot of people were saying, you know, isn't it ironic that the very thing that she claims doesn't exist, a.k.a. cancel culture, um, which, again, arguably I agree with her, it's not, it's, it's, it's an exaggeration of a symptom of the same system of oppression that we've all lived under for hundreds of years. Ain't nothing new under the sun. No. Um, but at the same time, it's just straight up harassment and targeted violence, right? That is, that is, that is not new. What, she's exper- what she is experiencing and has been experiencing is nothing new. And cancel culture, to me, will, you know, I may be wrong on this, and I'm wrong about a lot of things, but to me, cancel culture is something that was invented and manufactured to try to shield people who are instigating harassment and violence against other marginalized people and minorities, like this woman who, by speaking up against the people who signed on to this letter and speaking up against this letter and saying, hey, this is really just a, an attempt to censor people from holding people with privilege and in positions of power accountable for their statements, which they should be held accountable for, she ends up getting targeted with violence and harassment. And it's not ironic. It's, it's the truth. We are constantly targeted by violence and harassment for existing, for speaking up for our existence, for speaking up and out against the culture of oppression Um, and the systems of oppression that do exist. Um, And so, you know, I pointed this out to someone like, hey, this is the chickens coming home to roost. If you don't think that this is related to history and the fact that we've been getting it for hundreds of years, you're completely missing the boat. And they're like, no, you're talking about two things that are completely unrelated. Her getting harassed for speaking out against this letter has nothing to do with the fact that you know, Emmett Till was murdered based on a false accusation, that Ahmaud Arbery was murdered for jogging in his own neighborhood. They're completely unrelated. No, they're part and parcel of the same exact system of tyranny. Well, well put. And just so we don't pass up JFK, because I think this will tie into the larger theme of what we've been talking about. I, I think I don't write any blank checks for any president. But two things that he tangibly did that I appreciate. One, he, uh, most importantly, prevented the Gulf of Tonkin from getting to be worse than what it could have been and prevented a potential war with uh, La Isla de Cuba. Of course, uh, he did this within the larger hypocritical framework in which he cops many Cuban cigars before placing that embargo or or playing with that embargo on them the so there's a critique the second positive thing is and this is what some people say got him killed in the first place but the second positive thing is that he attempted to divorce fiat currency from the government by at least introducing as a as a competitor which is one of the things F.A. Hayek used to say is not even get rid of the fiat currency, but allow competition. Right now, competition is illegal of silver-backed 
currency or a currency based on a on a precious metal that has well, some sort of historic value. Crypto. Yeah, yeah, and now we have non we have cryptocurrencies as another yeah, no. competition no. that's not yeah. asking for permission. No, no, and not only that, but there are governments that are creating their own cryptocurrency and there are cryptocurrencies that are being backed by physical assets such as gold, such as silver, such as land. So, um, you know, it's going to happen regardless. The great thing about progress and change is that it's an undeniable force. No matter how much the powers that be try to keep it from happening, the status quo is not forever. Hey Amen. That, that's a beautiful place. We're going to stop there, Jonathan, and we're going to have to have you back to talk business and ping pong and so many other subjects. But you're definitely going to be one of our repeat guests on this program. I appreciate it, sir. I appreciate the time and I enjoyed the conversation.